sorry, this year, a happy new year. And we're ready to go. Yep. All right. So, good evening. Welcome to the Tammy and Taylor time. <laughs> Notice not only do we have a sort of synchronicity of names, but we have really beautiful and matching book covers, right? <laughs> Although, hilariously, Tammy's the very blue one is in the Louisiana Bayou, <laughs> where it's pretty hot. And, um, and Taylor's actually looks like the Colorado blizzard that it is. So what do these two authors have in common besides showing up tonight? And um, I think that both of them have made terrific use of the landscape of their books. So Tammy, what took you back to the Bayou? God, it's been since what, 1997? 20 years. Whoa. Since, well, yeah, well now, yeah, now it's almost 22 years. 22 years. Yeah, when I started this. It, that's a kind of a, uh, it's kind of a weird and sad story that it's been so long. So I, wrote, I first wrote a book called The Thin Dark Line 20 years ago with these characters. And when I finished the book, I'm like, you know, I really like these characters. And I had never written a sequel. At that point, everything was standalone. And I'm like, well, you know, I might, I might just want to write another book about these characters. And my editor at the time did not like the heroine. Really? Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> well, I was like, it's like, it's like saying you don't like Sandra Bullock. <laughs> How can you not like Annie? I didn't know editors were allowed not to like characters. She, she, well, it was Nita. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very opinionated lady. Right. And I never could figure out the why of it because honestly, she's like everybody's kid's sister, this girl. And she's like, eh, I don't really want another book with those characters. And that's a one and only time in my entire career that anybody ever said anything like uh -huh. that to me. And I was like, wow. <laughs> well, you know, she signs my check, so <laughs> I'll come up with something yeah, else. I'm just fascinated. I mean, I have rejected whole books, but as an editor, but I've never, I've never just said I don't like I those don't characters. Like that character. I can't ever write it again. Yeah, it was really, it was really strange. I've never figured out the why of that because I've certainly written characters that were more abrasive and less likable. You know, quote unquote likable. I hate that word, but um, I don't know for, for whatever reason that that happened. And so I ended up, you know, well, back to the drawing board, and uh, and I came up with what was then the first uh, book with Callback and Liska, which then became a series for me, you know. And now, lo, these many years later, I started hearing from readers, and they're like, Winnie, are you ever going to bring those characters back? It's my favorite book of all time. Oh. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I'd love to bring those characters back. I love those characters. I love that setting. You know, so that's what happened. <laughs> So in case you all think that we screwed up, we can't actually order it. <laughs> I made a heroic effort, but it is, it is actually a thin dark line is out of print right now. So um, otherwise, we'd have sent them up there for you all to read. All right, so Taylor, you live in Colorado, so I suppose it wasn't really bizarre that you would pick Colorado as a... Actually, I live in Seattle. Oops, sorry. Oh, you live I, in Seattle? Yeah. Oh. How did I think Colorado? Well, I apologize. All right. No worries. Didn't read your bio. Uh, so, <laughs> so what, in fact, made you write about Colorado? You needed a blizzard. Yeah. I mean, I like the idea of uh, just the hostility of a blizzard and just how oppressive and just how much that can apply pressure from the outside. And I had been to, I've been to Colorado exactly once, and I thought it was really cool, and I was like, I really want to set a book here. And uh, so that was the premise at a rest stop that, you know, the setting, I think, really needed that kind of environment. Well, you needed serious isolation yes. for this whole thing to go down, so we're a better fan of Blizzard. Now, I told Taylor I was going to ask him this question. I'm not asking it to embarrass him, but because I think it's an important question when you read the book. How did this woman, who was so unprepared, I'll call her unprepared, um, driving her car without gasoline and all the rest of it into the teeth of a blizzard going up a mountain? I know just really not a smart move. Um, how did she suddenly develop such chops when she got into the situation? Part of it is I'm from <laughs> Seattle, I think. <laughs> no, um, I think I really liked the setup, and I think what it comes down to is the emotional stakes, because she's just found out that her mom, who she has a really, really troubled relationship with, also has pancreatic cancer and not much time. And so her immediate priority is just getting there as fast as she can. And that involves some really bad decisions, just to, just for the sake of trying to get over the passes before. So she's coming happens. from Utah, Yes. Right? Dude, so or, that part I got right. Sorry, coming from <laughs> right. Boulder to Utah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, 
It's a great city all the way around. Um, so what happens when she gets up there? Well, well, don't say too much, but set it up for us. So she gets forced off the road, of course, because it is really rough weather. And uh, she winds up at a really small, kind of closed down rest stop with four other strangers. And mm -hmm. she's pretty certain that she's gonna have to spend the night and she's not happy about it. And she's kind of making small talk with people she's stuck with. And while she's trying to get signal to, with her phone outside, she sees one of the cars, which is a van that's parked right next to her, has a little girl in a animal crate. Oh. And she is stuck there with these, this handful of people, and she has to decide if she's going to intervene and how she's going to intervene. And they're stuck there all night. So there mm -hmm. she is, weaponless, gasless, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Not uh, prepared. <laughs> But it would be virtually impossible for a reasonable person or even unreasonable person to pass up a child in a cage without trying to do something about it. It's a very arresting, you know, visual even just to think about it, right, Kim? Oh my god, yeah. So how do you get your people into peril? Because, you know, we we're in the bayou and there's all those attendant dangers in the bayou. Yeah, well the bayou is just it's such a rich environment and it's so just <laughs> dripping with suspense all on its own so so it's a it's a fun it's a fun setting to write about my two main characters are, are detectives for the sheriff's office so <clears throat> they get called out in the middle of the night to uh, what turns out to be or looks to be a home invasion um, situation where a, a seven-year-old boy has been murdered quite brutally and his mother um, escaped and ran for help ran down the road ran for help so when they get the call she, the mom is uh, is in the hospital and the child is is dead and um, so they get drawn into that and they find come to find you know this woman is a, a single mother she's struggling she's poor she's with uh, all her her situation of how can she how can she possibly get ahead how can she make anything out of her life the situation that she's in and you know, because of the situation she's in, she's surrounded by some not so great people. But the, the place that she's been living is really isolated, so isn't it sort of inevitable that they would suspect that she had some, either was the actual killer or was completely... Sure, yeah, stuff? because she, she lives very near to the town, but she's just a little bit out of the town on this kind of creepy bayou road where there's just some really crappy little houses and um, nobody's really close. and. She doesn't really know her neighbors and stuff like that, and um, and yeah, who you know the first thing the first thing they they wonder is you know how does a mother escape and leave her child? Why would a killer kill a child and let an adult get away? Right. I thought the image of her running barefoot, you know, over these awful roads, where her feet are all shredded up and bleeding, was really very powerful. So um, I was thinking about this country. If any of you watch the Smithsonian Channel, it has a three-part thing called America's Mississippi, and it starts up in a little trickle up there in St. Paul, um, or up above the Twin Cities. But if you follow it down, the last one there, seriously, into the Mississippi Delta, and the, you know, the whole swamp, and these creatures, you know, are out and about. Um, they were just bears up north, but they're <laughs> really bad ones down there. You know, big gators and um, snakes, all kinds of things. It's a really dramatic three-part sequel, which I highly recommend. I mean, three-part series that I highly recommend to you. But if you want to get a feeling for the bio country that Tammy's writing about, it's a very strong visual. Or you could read James Lee Burke. Did you feel sort of a hot breath of James Lee Burke over your shoulder while you were writing? <laughs> Um, well, you know, we, we've actually been writing about Louisiana for about the same length of time. Have you really? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Which is kind of weird when you think about it. So, yeah. Well, yeah, these my experience with, you know, bio country. A lot of people have written about New Orleans. For a while, New Orleans was like this incredible mystery magnet. I mean, God, there were just, one year I remember there were like, you know, at least two or three dozen crime novels set in New Orleans, and now it seems to, maybe Katrina kind of removed some of the... Might have, yeah, it might have been. Um, but it, it's faded away. And um, so I, I think of 
the country <laughs> around it. And, you know, Candace, who writes, Candace C.S. Harris lives in that area, but she writes Regent City Historical Set in England, so there's no correlation. <laughs> and there's another man whose name I've forgotten who is writing a series set in Baton Rouge. She's done two books, but they're they're urban cop stories, you know, they're mm -hmm. not out in the in the landscape. Yeah. So. Well, you know, I'm from a rural area. I'm from Minnesota, but a right. rural area in a small town. So, so they that's always, it. yeah, well, you know, small towns are small towns. So you always have the, you know, some similar dynamics and, you know, you move it down south and heat it up with that weather and <laughs> just add, it ratchets up the tension a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and different animals. Horse yeah, animals, most right? definitely. So bears are they going to be an issue in the blizzard in Colorado? Just... I wish I thought of that. <laughs> in the sequel, you can have a bear. Yes. Ah, prying open the back of a car. You know, it's That'd interesting. Be I know. It would be. So this book had kind of an interesting history. Do I recall right that it was you published it? Well, it was with a uh, small press, um, Jaffe Books, in the UK. And uh, it. yeah, it was, it was my third thriller through them. And uh, it was published, I think, late 2017. And then um, they're a great publisher, and they're really good at getting uh, that marketing ebooks because they're digital only. And uh, mm. so it started to kind of rise up the ranks in Amazon. And then um, 20th Century Fox bought the film rights, and then William Morrow bought the North American rights, kind of one, two right after that. Oh, so there's going to be a movie. Fingers crossed. Oh. I really hope so. Actually, this is a book that would make a very powerful movie, and it is a standalone. So. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I mean, so, because we were talking last night with James Collins about <coughs> serial television is going to be working with Sigma Force, and it's an advantage to have multiple books about the same people for serial television, but your book actually shouts out for a movie. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, um, so how did you ever, how did you ever hook up with a small British digital publisher from Seattle? Well, why am I asking Seattle? Well, gotta be digital. <laughs> That's a really dumb question. I kind of stumbled into it, honestly. Um, I had just finished my first thriller, and I was like, okay, I should probably get an agent. I should probably, I had like a big uh, Excel spreadsheet of you know everybody I'd queried and kind of the status of it. And then in my spare time, I had also read an ebook that I really liked called Beneath the Watery Moon by Betsy Reevely, which is a, a British ebook, and it was through Jaffe Books, and I saw that they didn't require an agent to submit, and I liked their stuff, so I was like, sure. And I'm so glad I did it, because it kind of led me here. But it's been a really weird journey. Well, it's, it's different. I don't know if I'd call it weird, but I, I'm glad that it worked out that way. So it's almost, in a way, it's almost like the pre-Kindle program from Amazon, where kinda. you put it out there in digital and see what happens. And then, um, actually, it's been a very effective technique for them. When Robert Giacconi is here in April, if you come and uh, listen to him, he will tell you about how he's become a multi-million bestseller um, through that program by, you know, giving away all these digital books and stuff to a select group has created enough, I was distracted by the bison temporarily there, sorry, um, has created enough, what the, what's the hot word, buzz? Yeah, to get people interested in through the print edition and so forth. So, oh, that's very cool. So, what else can you tell us about? She's seen the child in the car. Is there anything you can tell us further without spoiling? You know, it's tricky without getting into spoiler territory, but it's kind of like a locked room thriller, and it's more a thriller than a mystery. There are some mystery elements, maybe some light horror elements, but it's basically a handful of people under pressure and trying to figure out how to do the right thing and the situation just escalates. So the people in the in the place where she <laughs> seeks shelter, basically yeah. it has to be one of them yep. that has the kid out in the car. So it's not likely that somebody's hiking back up the road for gas in the blizzard and has just <laughs> left it. Well, no. I mean, Unless they're that, from Seattle. That could, be, <laughs> that could be a scenario that somebody parked the van there and you know went away, but not in that weather, right? So that's the deal. She comes inside and she has to then try to figure out who, mm -hmm. um, right, who it might be. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We all have those moments. My phone will probably leap off the table here in a moment. Um, again, it is a locker room mystery in that sense, or it's a very close circle of suspects, but that's a very Agatha Christie kind of a, a thing, except it's a thriller. Can't really quite work that way. Yeah. 
Pam, do you think police procedurals are, are that shape where you've got, you know, kind of a close circle of suspects in a Christie style? They're not really thrillers. Yeah, I, I would I would say so. You know, you've got you've got the, the circle I and mean, that's how you run a, run a run an investigation. You start with the with the primaries and you work your way through their circle of acquaintances and you know, it's generally finite unless you have you know, uh, uh, a killer that's unknown to, to anyone. You know, if you've got a serial killer who's traveling through right. or something like that. But a small know. town almost, this almost creates that kind of, yeah. there can only be so many people who might right. actually be guilty. Right. Right. You got, I wish we could talk about how your case resolves because it's so, <laughs> it's so cool, but you'd all go home furious. <laughs> so there we are. So I, I could ask you, since you know you obviously had a wonderful time doing this, are you thinking about writing more about that? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I, I think what I do next will be will be these characters. I actually just finished this book in November. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, you you moved to Malibu. Well, I, I moved. I was living in Florida for for a few right. years, and uh, and then I moved back to Los Angeles. Flawless timing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh dear. Were so. you were you? Did you get really caught up in the in the Malibu fire? Uh, yeah, actually, I did. I'm, I'm uh, I am a refugee. Oh. Yeah. oh. My sure. my neighbor's house. I had just I had turned the book in like maybe two weeks before, and it, it, for, you know, I just I've had one of those periods of life where lots of unfortunate things have happened. You know, I lost my mom, I lost a dog, I lost a horse, I you know, had friends die. It was like one crazy catastrophe after the next. So it was taking me much longer than it would normally to write the book. And um, and we were down to like <laughs> they wanted Dutton wanted the book out this year or that last December year. December thirty first. Yeah, yeah they're they're like, please, it. please, please we want it out yeah. in, in twenty eighteen. And I'm like, I'll do everything I can. And um, and I finished it, and um, and two weeks later, I was homeless. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. I was in the, the Woolsey fire. I'm, I'm not in Malibu, I'm inland, I'm in the Thousand Oaks area. And um, yeah, that, that fire came. And you never think it's gonna come to your neighborhood, you just don't. You know, so I'm watching it on TV, and I'm like, well, that's over there, that's not by me. And then a, a friend called and she goes, no, I think it's closer to you than you think, you know? So I'm watching the news, I'm like, yeah, oh, it's a little too close for comfort. And uh, I have three neighbors on the street where I live and we were texting each other about, you know, what are we gonna do? Do we evacuate, do we not? And we were all kind of half ready. And then a call came to evacuate. And I'm like, well, I'm out of here. You know, I threw some clothes in a suitcase and grabbed my dog and off I went. And um, ended up in a hotel. Um, I had to go all the way. I live north of Los Angeles. I had to go all the way almost to LAX to get a hotel room because there was such an exodus. Um, you know, people fleeing the fire. And um, so I was sitting in my hotel room at like 3, 3.30 in the morning watching the live news coverage. Of in the your fire. own house as part of the news? My neighbor's house. Oh my my next door neighbor's house. I'm oh. watching and they're like, well, we're, we're in this region, you know, we're in this location, there's a fire station here. I'm like, oh my God, that's my neighborhood. And then they're like, well, here this, here's this one house that's on fire. And my neighbor's house had this kind of peculiar, distinctive chimney. And I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that's my neighbor's house. And I watched my neighbor's house burn to the ground. I live television. When they weren't saying anything about the house next door. They weren't saying that there was a house next door. And I'm like, it's gone. I just, it's, there's no way their house burns and my house doesn't burn because they're feet away from each other. I'm like, well, there it goes. And then the next morning, one of the other neighbors texted me and said, your house is fine. Oh, wow. That is so bizarre, the way fire could do that. Yeah, really. I had, my garage roof had started on fire and I don't know, you know there, I mean, there was a fire crew there trying to put everything out. I don't know if they put it out or if it just went out. I had no insulation over the garage, and that might have been what saved me. But after the fact, after we finally were able to go back and check the houses up, I had a guy up in my attic looking at things, and he came down and he said, I found a charred ember about this big that had landed on the metal drain pan 
of the heating and air conditioning unit in the attic. Oh, no. And it was like three inches away from insulation. Wow. And so, they had landed wow, that's there. really a fluke. Yeah, mm -hmm. seriously. Wow. So, yeah, but, but I had terrible smoke damage, wow. really bad. And it still is bad. I mean, it, we're like now two, two plus months into this. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't live in the house yet. Yeah. yeah, but that's miraculous that that ember had gone somewhere. Yeah, else, right? I mean, just like but I you said, I like to live there. Seat right there. Help tell. Well, I feel sure there's a book in there somewhere. Yes, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. We need to count. Nothing's ever wasted on an author, you know. You know, so, you know Brad Parks. Or no, um, Jeff Abbott, mm -hmm. poor soul. Lightning struck his house, and what he watched it burn to the ground, but not on a <laughs> television from across the street. Mm. Um, and yes, there, it's really freaky how uh, that happens for snow. Snow just blankets everything, right? Yeah, yeah. you don't get that this house is under the drift of this house is okay. That's very interesting. Snow back and forth. So, what are you working on next? I am working on a thriller, another thriller. Um, I don't know what I can say about it. Uh, <laughs> it involves a sister uh, who, or, I mean, young woman whose sister twin sister allegedly committed suicide randomly on a bridge in the middle of nowhere and she is determined to prove that it was not a suicide and so she corners the local cop who allegedly found the body there and intends to basically ambush him and confessing and so it's two timelines there's this happening on this bridge and then there's the last hour of the sister's life kind of intertwining oh. and uh it's the first time I've tried writing anything non-linear, so I'm trying a couple different new things with it, which is a lot of fun. It's giving me kind of a bunch of new tools to play with, um, and I think I'm, I'm hoping to have it done in like six months, but we'll see. <laughs> That's an interesting structure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like that? Yeah, I think it could be a lot of fun. Yeah, I do too. It's fun with how you can pace information out and how you can you know, reveal something and then immediately contradict it by the other timeline or, you know, hint at something and then it's, exactly. it's, it's fun. It's fun to put the readers in the position of knowing more than what's going, the people in the story actually know. I've always thought that was kind of a, you know, mm -hmm. which is really true of almost all historical fiction if you think about it, because, you know, you know I, I often, you know, yeah. we're living through such an awful time right at the moment and, you know, I go back to all the, the Regency novels I was mentioning. They know how the war came out, but nobody yeah. then knew until Waterloo. You know, it was a 20-year war. Imagine that, 20 years. God, I hope we aren't going to Lord. But it's very hard to live through a, a very unsettled, you know, time where you don't know what the outcomes may be. Um, afterward, you know, we can all be wise, right? But at the time, it, it isn't, um, isn't so easy. Well, do you guys have questions that you would like to ask our authors? Regrettably, we can't say much more about their books, or as I said, you'll <laughs> know. <laughs> just now. Yeah. All right, well, come on. I've got one. Tammy, you want a big question? Go back to um, I have to admit, I haven't read your books, so I don't know. Was it hard to resuscitate or revive 20-year-old characters? You know, it, it, was a, it was a little strange. Uh, it was a little daunting. <laughs> because I had had so much reader feedback. And then I'm like, well, I'm gonna go refresh my memory about, about you know, the characters. And, and, you know, a book I wrote 20 years ago is gonna have a little bit different style from a book I write today, because you evolve and you change. And, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, did, are, are readers gonna be upset if it isn't exactly the same kind of pace and the same kind of writing? And, um, you know, so I kind of, yeah, I, ran myself in circles over stuff like that for a while. Um, getting the characters' voices back in my head was not a problem at all, because they're very, very strong to me. And I, I hear, you know, I hear their accents. I, it's so strong to me. Yeah, I should have thought of asking you this, though. You had to make a decision about whether they aged 20 years or whether you just picked them up where they were. Yeah, I, let, I, I only let them go forward about six years in their timeline. And I have, I have finally learned the lesson of don't write a date in your story. <laughs> really lesson learned. Do that not awesome. do that. <laughs> and don't make a lot of pop culture references. Because 20 years later, people are like, what is that? What was that about? Or even be too specific sometimes about quantities of money. You know, because yeah, what, what was yeah. a big risk of, you know, way back, doesn't... Somebody was telling me that he'd written a series of golf mysteries, 
and you know the, the prize that the professional golfers was just ludicrous. You know, but, but he got around later. So he said, you know, "Fifteen dollars." Yeah, yeah. Never, you know, never tie yourself down to a specific dollar amount, too. It would be. But isn't that great that you can choose how how much people, you know, how much of your lives? I wish I could do that on my own. No, get it. I just have a birthday. Which my life had only advanced six years. <laughs> right. Yeah. And didn't you also give them a somewhat different domestic scenario? Yeah, in the, in a thin dark line, you know, spoiler alert, um, at the end of the book, Nick Nick and Annie are talking about maybe going forward and having a relationship. He's an extremely difficult guy. He's He's, he's a lot of horse, as we say in the horse business. He's a typical guy. And, and they have a discussion about, are they going to go forward and try to have a relationship? And he would like for that to happen. And, and she says, okay, let's try that. And um, when we pick them up and in this book, they've, they're married and they have a, they have a son. So they've, they've, gone, they've gone into a, 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 really, and a really solid marriage, you know, which people would people would not have expected of him in particular because he was such a loner and so difficult. Yeah, but I think for the story to really have as much emotional resonance as it does, they're having a son and then this little boy killed, you know, it adds a Yeah, for, for each of them, yeah, yeah. for each of them, you know, there, she's looking at it from the perspective of a little mother. She's also looking at it from this per perspective of a daughter who lost her mother. Right. Um, yeah, so she's got she's got that going on. My, it was similar to his, except in that way. So, do you have like notes that you went back to, or did you just kind of like reread your book almost? I yeah, I, I did go back and reread the book somewhat. Not really. Not I didn't read the entire thing through because it's pretty well imprinted, and you know, you just have to dig in the file folder back there. <laughs> Um, but I did actually find my notes, which that was a miracle, because I can't find the grocery list. And, uh, but I did find a folder with the notes from when I wrote that book, so that was really helpful. And then I'm assuming you don't have the same editor? No. <laughs> no, you know, her life moved down. Her, she moved down. And is no longer editing. Right? But I know who she means. So I know her, too. <laughs> No, and my and my current editor was thrilled with these characters. She loved them. So you have to understand that in in major publishing, it's like a Game of Thrones at all times, and it's gotten worse. So um, you know, I watch it's kind of dizzying. Imprints come and go. You know, editors drop out and decide they're going to do something of their own. Um, you know, I mean, it's really hard to keep up with who's doing what and where and. I, I've had to learn to delete old emails and Gmail, you know, because I can type in like a name and I could get four different email mm -hmm. addresses for this person and then trace, you know, where, where they've they been. Were. And, you know, it really is, it really is interesting to me to have a progression. Yeah. And then all the things come to an end, you know, for some people. And I, and I went to a different publisher, too. That, too. Although now you're back in the same umbrella, that, yeah. you know, yeah. that's another thing. It's, that's it's such an incestuous I know, story. it really is. It's too funny. I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, because you've just done this one book with William Morrow. It's a lot to learn. You, you, there you is probably weren't born when my first book came out. <laughs> 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 certainly wasn't born when I started reading. <laughs> just watching Sue Bafton go by and, you know, trying not to cry. She died just over a year ago and thinking about, you know, there was a long time, you know, arc that we all thought would come to an end, you know, with Z. And so sometimes things don't work out quite the way we, we plan them. So you got to glom on to somebody, books that you like and authors that you like while you can, you know, because life's uncertain. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, Taylor, <clears throat> when you're writing... Um, this book, how much did you use your research to investigate and decide what kind of a plot you're going to do? Do you do a lot of research, or does it just come? Uh, the story comes to you, and you just sort of flesh it out? Or You know, it's a little bit of both, because I think research can kind of come in in two main ways. First of all, just researching an area, researching pictures, researching, you know, the the props, the locations, like that can really fuel your imagination and fuel ideas of, okay, this would be cool if. And then 
The other thing that maybe I do research even more for is I've already decided I really want this in the story and now I need to find a way to justify how that could be physically possible. So I need to find the exact right way that that could be justified or at least sound plausible. Somebody once said, and I think it Pam said it was Manette Walters actually, that the end of a book has to be as good as the beginning. It's okay if it sags in the middle, but so if you have a dynamite setup, you also really can't let the reader down with a weak conclusion. So did you see your way, you, you obviously had a great setup, you've already decided from getting up to the top of the mountain, but nonetheless, there she is with the kite. Did you see your way to the end and then it was a question of how to get there? Or did you just stir along and hope it would all go well? I remember for the first couple drafts, I remember thinking, I like the setup, the first act or so really feels like it writes itself, but man, I've got to stick the landing. And so I, I spent a lot of time on the second half and a lot of time, especially in the final final act, exactly you know how you, how you say, because like the final act is kind of like the distillation of what the story is about, and so it needs to be it needs to be impactful, and it needs to yeah yeah. Okay, but did you see it or did you evolve it as you oh, went through the story? Oh, I definitely evolved toward it. The first couple versions of it were nowhere near good enough. I mean, that's a question that people often ask. You know, did you outline it or you know know where you were going or did you make it up? What do you do? Jane? Oh, I'm totally seat of the pants. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm a banster. I, you know, I'll have, a, I might have an agenda going in, or I might think, yeah, I want this person, and this is who it is, and I'll always change my mind probably at least three times, and sometimes right up until the very, very end. When I wrote uh, Within Dark Line, I was easily two thirds of the way through the book, and I didn't know who did it, <laughs> and I was like. I gotta come up with something. <laughs> and I literally sent the book, that was when you sent things through the mail. And um, I sent the book to New York and I, and I, I said, oh, I, I want everybody just to read this and, and see what you think. You know? oh. And really kind of like, see if you can guess who did it. <laughs> and they did, they totally fell for that. And, um, and I remember uh, t talking to, to my editor, talking to Nina, and she's like, well, I don't know. First I thought it was this person, and I thought it was that person. And then I thought, no, it's, maybe it's this person, who was someone I had not even considered. She's like, only Terry would be twisted enough to have it be that person. I'm like, all right. <laughs> No, I sent I sent them like two thirds of it, but I always do that. That's that, I, I have the weirdest relationship with my editors. They that when I send in my you know quote unquote outline because I don't do an outline, they don't ever want to know how it ends. Like oh no, tell me. <laughs> okay, you know because I probably don't know. So what's the point of saying it anyway? So I just say well you know it's these people and this is a situation and stuff happens. The end. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to know. Yeah. Well, I guess we could argue that if you're surprised, everybody that's, else will that's be. That's always been my contention. Yeah, yeah. that's really things that I saw that one. Yeah, it was yours, sir. And so, what significance does uh, Utah have in your in your character? Is that just a segue to get that person to Colorado? Or? Yeah, it's where she's from, and it's kind of her intended destination. Um, but back, right? yeah, the the whole story takes place either in that rest stop or inside the building itself. Did I say, I'm sorry, did I see another hand up? Oh, yes, I have a question. Do your family and friends look at you and say, you're just a little weird? <laughs> sorry, the question is. They look at you and like say, yeah. Do your Don't family you and friends people? think you're weird? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or are you doing all this? Not weird, but kind of frightening because you can think yeah, of all these things. Or frightening things really because you can think of this stuff. Well, they all, they all know I could kill you and get away with well, it. <laughs> so don't mess with Tammy. And uh, it, it, when when people think it's really weird when I talk about my process, because to me, when I'm in that process, those those characters take over, and um, I don't always have a lot of say in the matter. And um, you know, they might want to go in a direction I hadn't intended to. They're all almost always correct, 
in that, but we might have arguments about it in, in my head, and I mean, we'll have like whole conversations that have nothing to do with the book. I mean, it's, it, it is weird. I mean, it is weird. So yeah, so yeah, people who, when they hear that part of it, they're like, you realize people will think you're insane. I get paid to be insane. That's the, that's the trick. It's imaginary friends. It's like, it's like Harvey, if you were real, you know, yeah. over here. I like to think that my family and friends all aren't afraid of me. Um, I'm sure my I'm sure my Google search history is pretty horrifying and is probably on an FBI agent's wall somewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I think everybody. My my dad, one of his coworkers, had read one of my books and he'd been like, "Does it bother you that there's so much darkness in your son?" And my dad was like. Maybe, maybe it does now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And if you wrote it out, then maybe you're not hard. You're not, you're not yeah. 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 I, I actually was on an FBI list. I, I got, really? I, yeah, my phone was tapped. Oh, uh, yeah, but it, not on purpose. I mean, they weren't really after me. It was, act, it's sort of, I was, a, I was like collateral damage. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I was living in a, um, I was living in a townhouse. I had gone to Florida for a, a, for a winter. I, I was uh, showing horses then, and you go, that's where you go in the winter. And so I was in a townhouse that shared a wall with a family. And they were not from Florida. I don't know where they were from. They, they were Spanish-speaking people. I didn't know them. They seemed perfectly pleasant. Man and wife, been there probably late 30s. Uh, son and a daughter and a dog. I mean, they were, you know, lovely family. <coughs> and uh, over the course of time, I, I, something was going wrong with my phone. Constantly from when I moved in, a land, this is, yeah, back in the day, yeah, back in the day, and I was constantly complaining to the phone company about this phone, and and they sent somebody out. The, the first guy they sent out got on the phone in the kitchen. He did that thing when it rings back, and he's like, "Huh, it sounds like something's picking up your line," and I just flipped out because. <laughs> Where's my mind gonna go? And uh, and he went out and he goes, oh, I have to make, I have to go out to the truck. And then he came back and he's like, oh no, that's not, no, it's not. So you you need a new phone or something. And this went on and on and on. And it got to be a joke, you know. I would get on the phone with people and you'd hear these sounds, click clack, you know. And I would make jokes about how, you know, the FBI was probably listening to our conversation. <laughs> and I was working on a book. And you know, we, writers get stuck in places. You call other writers, and I had a particular friend who was in, uh, a, she was a uh, an ER nurse before she was a writer. So when I have questions about gruesome bodily things, I call her. You know, so I call her, and I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do with this guy. You know, he was nice. <laughs> He's a nice guy. I liked him. He's kind of served his purpose. I'm really bored. <laughs> And she goes, well, kill him. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know. How should I do it? <laughs> if I shot him in the face with a shotgun, could he still have an eyeball? <laughs> so we had this whole it's bizarre conversation. And, you know, to say nothing of the fact that I had a long distance boyfriend at the time, and that I really don't want to know what they were listening to. And, um, Long story short, it, it became known that they were investigating the neighbor. And all our, our phone lines came into the same box on the back of this building. And um, you know, so I, I just kept complaining about the phone, complaining about the phone. And finally, they, the, I, it was a Sunday, and I was on deadline. And, I, and then you had to call and actually speak to human beings at the publisher. Uh -huh. And they had to call you and ask you, you know, whatever. And people couldn't get through, and I was losing my mind. And I called on a Sunday to the phone company and just, you know, had a fit. And then we said, okay, we'll send somebody on Monday between 2 and 4. I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting there working Sunday afternoon, and my doorbell rings. And I go to the door, and I look out, and it's a guy in a phone company uniform. <laughs> he actually looked like an axe burglar. <laughs> he was a scary looking guy. And I, you know, kind of cracked the door open. And I'm like, you're not supposed to be here. You're, you're coming tomorrow. And he goes, oh, well, I was just in the area. Oh. Like, that ever happens. <laughs> I'm like, uh -huh, you're not coming in my house. No, I'm not letting you in my house. 
And he's like, well, maybe I can work out, you know, maybe it's a problem in a box on the, you know, where the line comes in the house, you know, so he's back there doing his thing. And, and I'm, you know, watching him like a hawk through the patio door. And, and uh, he did a few things. He goes, oh, you know, I think I can maybe take care of this out at the street. And I don't think you'll have any more trouble. And he went away. And my phone started working fine. And I'm like, well, that was weird. And a few days later, I get a, a, my doorbell rings. I go to the door. There's a man in a suit standing on the doorstep. And I'm like, who are you? What do you want? <laughs> and he goes, FBI. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, I, I want to see ID right now. And he's like, oh, you think it's a joke? I said, no, I don't think it's a joke. I want to see your ID. You know, so he shows me his ID. And I'm like, what could you possibly want with me? Well, we're just in the neighborhood doing some background <laughs> checks. And I just wanted to ask you some questions about your neighbor. And I'm like, I don't really know them. He says, well, do they actually sleep in that house? What kind of question is that? I think, I think, where else would they sleep? They live there, you know? We ask all these questions. And then my phone rings while he's talking to me. And I just let it ring. And he's like, aren't you gonna answer now? I said, no, I'll let the machine get it. I'm talking to you. I think you should answer that. <laughs> All right, so, so I go and I answer the phone and it's a TV producer who's like, hi, Tammy, I'm so-and-so from PBS. We're doing a documentary on the history of mystery writers in America. We'd like you to be a part of it. <laughs> Can you talk to me? And I said, you know, not right now, because I've got the FBI at my front door. <laughs> Let me call you back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it, it turned out, you know, it turned out they were investigating these people. I found out years later they were uh, they were involved in arms dealing. Oh my I have no idea, no no oh, clue at all. No, 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 no reason that I would know that. But the, yeah, they were looking at me for a while there. <laughs> Do you realize if you were Michael Conley, this would already be a book? You know? <laughs> <laughs> what was the one you wrote? Anybody remember? Remember about the phone? It was the dime? Wasn't it the dime? Um, it was the dime. Because um, you, it, was, it all involved. Anyway, it all involved. Random telephone. Patrick, what was the Michael Connolly book about the phone? Chasing the Dime. Chasing the Dime. Thank you. At least I had the dime for it, right? Okay, so you could, in fact, do something really interesting. I, yeah, I don't know why I've never I, I've never done anything. This is great. We're giving her all these blood. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I know. I'm the book, voice of that. The agent would come in the door when you went to answer the phone. That's true. Do you have questions, sir? Well, uh, back to the, the, to the guy who'd been outside, the, the quote, telephone guy. When I run across, when I see that in a, in a TV show or in a book, I'm saying, why the hell isn't she calling the cops? <laughs> well, that's, that's why I wouldn't let him in the house. I mean, you know, but he was in a uniform, and you know, so I thought, well, that's, you know, I don't know. And I, and I said to him, you know, I, um, yeah, I wouldn't let him in the house. And then as soon as he said, well, I'm going to go to the truck and I'm going to go to the back of the house, I ran upstairs immediately to look out to see if there was a, a phone company van. You know, I was like, well, okay, if he, he could be some random murderer, but he's probably not going to have a truck from at and you know. So I went and looked out, and yeah, it was a phone company van out there, and I'm like, well, I'm still not letting him in the house. <laughs> you know, he wasn't, do, you know, he wasn't doing anything menacing. He, you know, he, he, uh, he didn't threaten me. He didn't, you know, he didn't have a weapon. He didn't, you know, there was really... All the best serial killers look like regular guys. That's true. <laughs> but, you know, then what do you do? You call 911 and say, there's a phone company guy on the house on Sunday. Because you know, they might think that was weird enough to send uh, well, to send said he's just in the neighborhood. They would have already known that it was something deeply suspicious. It really is. <laughs> Working on a Sunday. What are the odds, right? So did anybody right. come so on Monday? Back then. And from two to four? No, no, okay. that was him. That was, was him. Oh, that was him. Just happened to be in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love that. Well, all right, Patrick, well, are you wanting to um, for me to sign off on our video, yeah. or you unless just, you want to? No, just hanging around. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. ever sure. Yeah. Right. Um, anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. Are you going to write any more of the Elena books? Oh, Elena. I would like to write another Elena book, and that's well, been a long time. Yeah, and I and I do get a lot of requests for her too. So yeah, I think I will. I'm not exactly sure when. I sort of accidentally started all these series and not thinking that I would have to keep, yeah. people would say, well, why don't you write another one? <laughs> I liked her character. 
she yeah she's she's a she's a really um she's actually she's a fun character and she is seriously screwed up but that those are the characters that are the most in, most interesting for me to to write about so i like her a lot i, I would like to go back to her okay. all right so um sorry do you have any questions here I have I've not had that happen, but that's a really, it's a really uh, yeah, interesting question. I don't I don't really know what you would do about that if they're publishing it as being anonymous. They're not taking, you know, not taking credit. So and you can't say who they are. So I don't know what you would do but about that. Thinking when you were talking about the fire, how fortunate it was you turned in the book. Oh yeah, my God! If I had not turned in the book, I I don't know what I mean, I would. What if you actually lost? <laughs> your, I mean, I'm paranoid about that. My husband is like, I don't yeah. have any backup systems. No, so I'm writing a newsletter. I just can hardly stand the thought of it. Well, like, you know, I, I I grabbed the laptop. Right. The laptop went with me, and everything is saved to the cloud. So right. Yeah. You know, theoretically, I don't lose it. So yeah, thank God for that. It's really true. Or just losing your phone and your photos or anything like that when oh, yeah. the same thing. My husband seems to drop phones and people run over them or they fall <laughs> off on a regular basis, you know, so he didn't have, obviously me getting deeper pockets. <laughs> that may be the explanation, but for anybody who's lost, you know, something like that, that's a, a real trauma. My, my neighbor is a, is a writer director and he lost, you know, he lost tons of stuff you know, and I feel Jeff was talking about you know watching his his books and all of his research stuff go up mm. against you know with a lightning strike you don't have time to do anything except be lucky that you can get out of the house and you know fires are terrible and then also fires that trigger off your sprinkler system if you happen to have one which in Scottsdale you do mm -hmm. the water is actually just as damaging as the fire so um, that can be. You know, so I guess everybody who's cr doing creative work or any kind of work or has possessions and all that they love, um, it's a terrible trauma to, you know, to think about that. I was just thinking about you thinking about your house just went up. Oh. Yeah. All right. So, um, well, this has been a really interesting evening. Thank you all so much for coming out. Let's give our authors a round of applause. I'd like to thank our Facebook and YouTube audience for joining us as well. And for any of you who would like to share this program, you can go to our Facebook page and you can share it to your own Facebook page so that people can see it, right? So um, I'm going to ask the authors to wander over to this table where the gingerbread lurks.